<laughs> so I'm delighted to uh, introduce John Conley, who's a noted professor here at Loyola. And John, you ready to go? Yes, I'm ready to go. Hello, right. everyone. My name is Father John Conley. And as Brian said, I'm a Jesuit priest here at Loyola University, Maryland. I have the exalted title of the Francis J. Knott Professor of Philosophy and Theology. I always oh. say that's K-N-O-T-T, -T, not N-O-T, because I'm, <laughs> I'm all in favor of philosophy and theology. And some of you may remember me several years ago before the pandemic. I know that sounds like a century ago, <laughs> but a couple years ago before the pandemic, I did Holy Week services at St. Alphonsus. Oh, and in the great Jesuit tradition on Good Friday, I got mixed up and we ended up venerating the cross before the prayers of the faithful in the middle till someone tapped me on the shoulder that I had hit the wrong ribbon at a certain point. As you know, there is an expression in the church as confused as a Jesuit in the Holy Week. And although I do love the liturgy, unfortunately that Good Friday was one to remember for a good bit of confusion up there in the sanctuary, but everything worked out fine at the end. Um, Father O'Donnell, uh, who lives with us here at uh, in the community here at uh, Loyola, Maryland, asked me to give a little talk on St. Edmund, Edmund Campion. Okay. And so um, let me just give uh, the presentation on Campion. And then at the end, if you have questions, I have I, champion. I, I'm happy to, um, to address them. If you look at the icon of the window, which should be on your screen, <clears throat> At least it's on my screen. I'm never quite sure how these things work. It's on our screen. Okay. It's interesting when you look at this, you see Edmund Campion in the middle. On his side, you have the two companions who were martyred with him, Alexander Briant and Ralph Sherwin. But as is typical of many traditional icons of um, martyrs, they show the instrument of martyrdom by which the person was killed. And Edmund Campion and his companions were hanged at Tyburn. This was a hill. It's, a, it's become a sacred mm -hmm. site for Catholic pilgrims. If you visit London, it's worth going to Tyburn. There's a little chapel nearby, which recalls the English martyrs as many of their relics. And you see there's a noose around his neck because the sentence was to be hanged but then drawn and quartered, quartered yeah. and especially violent death. I won't get into all the details, but it meant you took down the body before the person was dead. I found it odd. You would have a doctor present to make sure you hadn't killed the person by hanging. And then the person <laughs> was dismembered. And, you know, this is not uh, the way you want to die. And these three were martyred on Tyburn Hill at the gallows on December 1st, 1581. And that is the feast of St. Admin and his companions, and a number of the English martyrs who were canonized in 1970 by uh, Pope Paul VI. So they are part of the martyrs for the Catholic faith under the reign of Elizabeth I. Now, I'd want to walk you through, I think, one of some of the significant moments in the life of Camp. Turn it up, and I got to um, stretch my foot up now. And then reflect on uh, to what extent he's a typically Jesuit saint, which I think is a very interesting the question. Cool you can see who's on. They can't I don't see, see you. Hey guys, we should all mute ourselves so that we're not getting the feedback. Thank you. Okay. All right, first of all, he's born in 1540 in a middle-class family. He's the son of a bookseller. And we shouldn't be surprised he's someone who throughout his life will put a great deal of emphasis on literacy, education, and also the importance of books, pamphlets, and uh, broadsheets that he will be distributing as part of sort of an underground movement with the Catholics in England later in life. We know that he was raised a Catholic, but at an early age, he got a scholarship to Oxford. He was at St. John's College in the Oxford system. He received a very unusual honor as a teenager. At the age of seven, he was made a junior fellow of St. John's College at Oxford. And we know that as a teenager, he already had a reputation as an outstanding public speaker, as an orator. And later when he's ordained a priest, he will have that reputation as a first-class preacher. He was chosen, for example, 
to address Queen Elizabeth herself, Elizabeth I, when she went on an official visit to Oxford University, as was the custom, you would choose one of your best students to address the monarch on behalf of the faculty and students of the college. So this was a great honor in your teen years to be chosen to address the queen herself as she arrived at one of the Oxford colleges for an official tour. And that was in 1566. Now, the next step in his life is he clearly is a member of the Church of England. That he becomes an Anglican at some point. We know he signed the Oath of Supremacy, which recognized the monarch of England, Queen Elizabeth, as head of the church in England. We also know he was ordained a deacon in the Church of England in 1564. But we also know that after several years, he was never ordained a priest in the Church of England. He had doubts about Anglicanism and Protestantism in general, and wondered if the Catholic Church was the church founded by Christ. He then was sent on a special mission to Ireland, influenced by Oxford connections, that he was to help to start a university in Dublin. And the university he helped to begin with others later became the famous Trinity College uh, in Dublin. Its foundation dates from that period. He also wrote a history of Ireland, his scholarly side, his research side. And I should add here that Irish Catholics hate this history of England, because of Ireland, because the point of history was to show it's when the English colonized Ireland and imposed English rulers that Ireland made a step forward as opposed to the old Celtic chieftains. So his history of Ireland has never been a favorite with the Irish and is often pointed to as an example of sort of Protestant British colonialism with an anti-Irish and anti-Catholic uh, sentiment. And then he slowly but surely began to turn toward Catholicism and distance himself from his Anglican ties. Now, in 1571, clearly he has become a Catholic and he flees England to go to France. And there was a political crisis in the Catholic world. Pius V, the Pope at the time, formally and publicly excommunicated Elizabeth I. And the Pope suggested, without dotting the I's crossing the T's, that Catholics no longer had allegiance to her, not just as head of the church in England, which the Catholic Church had always denied, but also as the Queen of England. And there was a very small group of Catholics who did indeed try to kill Elizabeth and put a Catholic pretender to the throne on the throne of England. But we do know that um, Campion and his allies refused to follow them on this. Uh, his view was the queen is not the head of the church in England, the Pope is, but he argued the parliament has the right to determine who the true pretender to the throne is. It's clearly Elizabeth. And he insisted throughout his ministry, because English Catholics were divided on this point, that politically they should be faithful to Elizabeth and recognize her as a legitimate monarch. Now, after he flees France in 1571, I'm sorry, flees England, he ends up in Douai, which is a college town in France. Robert uh, Parsons had founded a college in France for exiled Catholics, both lay people and priests. There was also uh, an institute for English women who wanted to become nuns, uh, which uh, Jenna Simmons, I forget exactly what the order is called, in England is a representative of that group. And this was a very important college because the Douay Reims Bible, which is the first complete translation of the Bible into English, was written basically at two places. Most was written at Douay, but other parts of it were completed at Reims, uh, a cathedral town in France. And so this was a center just not for educating younger Englishmen and women who were in exile because of the persecution of Catholics in England under Elizabeth, but it was also a scholarly center. And their translation of the Bible was not their only scholarly work, but it was the most impressive. And it remained a standard edition of the Bible for centuries. Richard Chaloner 
modernized the Bible a bit in the 18th century. Uh, there are still people who prefer the Douay Reims version of the Bible, although that is not commonly used. I'll be honest, I tried reading the translation of St. Paul's epistles in Douay Reims. It is very rough going to figure out exactly what is being said, but it's a venerable version and he was there. He studies um, theology during this period, but he learns about the Jesuit order, which is a new order. It's a 16th century order in the church, was very impressed by the Jesuit ideals there were very few English Jesuits at that time. There was no English province. So he went directly to Rome, met the head of the order, Father General. He was given an novitiate in Rome, and then he was uh, ordained a priest. He was sent to teach at a Jesuit college in Prague, in what today would be the Czech Republic. And again, this is a, a very well-educated person, but as you can see, very cosmopolitan, who spoke different languages and sort of was touching down on different places in the Catholic world. Now, his life changed again in decisively in 1580. Um, Robert Persons had uh, decided that he wanted to ask the Pope to authorize a mission of Jesuits to England to assist the persecuted Catholics. Uh, the head of the Jesuits agreed, the Pope agreed, this was a secret decision, and the priests involved in this, as well as their lay supporters in England and Scotland, knew this was an extraordinarily perilous mission, which may well mean death for those involved, which did turn out to be uh, the case. In 1580, he lands at Dover. Like many Jesuit priests during this period in England, he was known for his disguises. And when he arrived at Dover, he had papers who indicated he was a jewelry dealer. And apparently, you know, he knew how to drive a very hard bargain on things made out of gold <coughs> or silver that came from uh, the continent. At other times, he would be a folk singer going around the taverns. But after he had done his singing and his disguise, he would be talking with people. And sometimes he would start talking about the gospel, talking about uh, the church. He then wrote his most famous composition. It's called Campion's Brag. And this composition tried to explain why he felt the Protestants were wrong and said he wanted to debate the Protestants publicly to hear their arguments and to defend the Catholic position during the conflicts of the Reformation and try to show why the Catholic Church had been founded uh, by Christ. And this is uh, from, I wanna cite a sentence from the Bragg that shows the quality of his writing as well as his religious zeal. He described his mission to the English as quote, one of free cost to preach the gospel to minister the sacraments, to instruct the simple, to reform sinners, to refute error, in brief, to cry a spiritual alarm against foul vice and proud ignorance. He has this sort of litany-like quality, this poetic prose that you will find in his writings and in the few letters of his which have uh, survived. He uses disguises as he moves from one place to the other. We know he worked at times in London, the most dangerous place to be a priest. He also would go up to areas around Lancaster. Uh, it is true today, as well as in the 16th century, there are groups of what we call recusant Catholics, Catholics who never abandoned the Catholic faith during the anti-Catholic persecutions in the 16th and 17th century. He was in touch with those communities. He wore a number of different disguises. This was part of the mystique of the Jesuits who were roaming the countryside. And he also was hidden by a number of families, especially by English Catholic women. And I remember a couple of years ago, they were describing a mansion near Lancaster, which was known to be the house of a Catholic family. And they knew priests were hidden there, but they could never figure out where the priest hole was. These play, there'd be a panel that would open up or a secret attic or a secret basement in which you would hide a priest. 
And what had always baffled historians and architects and the police authorities in the early days was where they were hiding the priests in this mansion. And it wasn't until they bought out the wrecking ball because this mansion had been abandoned that they finally figured where this ingenious hiding place was uh, in this particular house. So he was very much part of that. The priest would come secretly, suddenly, your baptisms, your confessions, regularized marriages, but he was very well known as a preacher and people would be invited who were known Catholics to um, hear him preach. He was also known when he talked with people to focus on the idea of Christ as king. We'll talk about that a little later, how central that image is in the spiritual exercises of Ignatius of Loyola and Jesuit spirituality. But this seemed to be his favorite metaphor for Christ and to say we owe allegiance to our earthly king and he would admit Elizabeth, is our earthly king or queen at this moment. She's our legitimate monarch, our spiritual king, who is the Pope, the vicar of Christ. But ultimately our allegiance is to Christ the King and our prayer and spiritual life should focus on that dimension as his loyal subject. He also published uh, a new book called the uh, Decem Rationes. In English, that means 10 reasons. And it's 10 reasons why he thought the Catholic faith was true. And once again, he desired Protestant ministers, learned Protestant ministers to debate him uh, publicly. This was published in 1581. And there was a Catholic laywoman, Dame Cecilia Stoner, S-T-O-N-O-R, because it was often women who maintained the priest holes, but she had a secret printing press in her country house. So she published this new pamphlet by him and it was distributed in the pews of the chapel of Christ College at Oxford, the leading chapel about an hour before Sunday services. So in the midst of these controversies, the Anglicans arrive at one of their premier churches in the most prominent university to find in the pews hundreds of copies of this hidden Jesuit trying to explain to them why their faith was wrong, the Catholic faith was right, and throw down the gauntlet. And again, Jesuits love debating. Our schools usually have good debating societies for good or ill. That's always a controversy among our high school teachers, how much debating you teach um, our students. And here he is throwing down the gauntlet right in the midst of a fortress of Anglicanism. And then the end of, uh, of Campion, he was preaching to a group of people who were invited to the home of a Catholic aristocrat, someone who seemed to be very positive toward him and had just received communion. We don't think mass was celebrated. The time is too brief. He had Viaticum with it and distributed communion. This man betrayed him to uh, the British police, but he was hiding with his two companions in a part of the house and it took a 12 hour search by a group of British soldiers and police to discover the three of them. Then they were arrested. He was sent to the Tower of London. We know he was tortured on several occasions by the use of the rack, but he would not uh, say he was guilty of the crime he was accused of. He was accused of treason against the queen and being part of a violent conspiracy to remove Elizabeth from the throne and to put a Catholic pretender on the throne, which he denied, and there's no evidence that he supported that. There's a great deal of evidence from the testimony of others. He had always told them politically to remain faithful to Elizabeth as the legitimate uh, Queen of England. Something macabre but interesting is also in prison, four times they brought in a group of Protestant theologians to debate him, even though he could hardly stand and his arm had been permanently distended because of the torture. But according to those present, he held his own in these debates with the Protestants in trying to show the truth of the Catholic faith. But he and his companions were found guilty of treason. There was no question the jury was stacked, what the outcome would be. And as a matter of fact, by this time, it was considered treasonous to celebrate mass, which he certainly had done on some occasions, or to be ordained a priest by a Roman Catholic bishop, which he was. It was also considered treason 
to house a person who had been ordained a Catholic priest, who had been ordained a priest by a Roman Catholic bishop. So the many people, especially the women who had sheltered him and given him support, some later would be arrested and some would die like Margaret Clitheroe. I'm not quite sure what happened to Lady Stoner who I'm find an interesting figure in this story, but I am not an expert on English history. I, I work much more on the other side of the channel in French history uh, during this period. So he was condemned to death. And on December 1st, he's taken to uh, Tyburn and there he is um, hanged. When he's alive, he's drawn and quartered and his relics become extremely valued by the Catholic community. And of course, centuries later, Tyburn, because of his death and the death of hundreds of others of Catholics for defending the Catholic faith and celebrating the mass and sheltering priests will become one of the great shrines for English Catholics in the city of London. Now that in brief is the story of Edmund Campion, but just a few points on why I find him such a Jesuit saint. And I think it's an interesting question. Anyone who dies for the Catholic faith is a martyr and is considered a saint, no matter what the rest of their life was like. But there's sort of uh, five points here, I think, that are striking. First of all, in the Jesuit order, you know our motto, for the greater glory of God. Ignatius talked about the magis. He wanted men to enter and persevere in the order who weren't just committed to doing good for God's sake, but were committed to the greatest thing they could do for God. And clearly in the case of Campion, there was a moment he could have made another decision. When he was at Douai College, he could have stayed and done very valuable work as a teacher and also as a scholar. Uh, there's no question he knew his Latin because he wrote in Latin, he didn't just translate it, and that he could have easily mastered uh, biblical Greek and Hebrew and been part of that team. The life of a teacher scholar, which would have been a life of great service, but he had a desire for the greater service, so he entered the Jesuit order, which was considered rigorous by its vow of obedience, and we know he strongly agreed with persons on the need for a mission to England, even though he knew that might well involve uh, his own death. The second is the importance of learned ministry in the Jesuit order. I'm often asked why we spend so many years in school when we're Jesuits. Most of us these days enter after getting our undergraduate degree. It's about 10 years from the moment we enter the novitiate, and Brian was one of my fellow novice mates many years ago, until the moment we're ordained priests. And I was ordained a priest right here at the uh, Alumni Chapel of Loyola University, Maryland, many years ago. One of the reasons is Ignatius saw that the ignorance of the clergy was one of the reasons for distrust of the church and one of the reasons for the Protestant Reformation. And the church could never reform itself and become the church it should be without men who are very learned. Campion was an extremely learned man. This was an A-plus student, a fine public speaker, a very polished writer, and he had that learning that is essential, I think, to Jesuit life and brought that to his work, writing in Latin, writing in English, preaching. I would also say the third point, similar, eloquencia perfecta, the ability to speak well, the ability to write well, with a certain eloquence to what you're saying, that gives it a power to convince, a power to persuade. Everyone who heard him thought he had that. The power of his pamphlets, Campion's Brag, the 10 Questions pamphlets of his letters that remain indicate this was someone who put eloquence at the service of the gospel. I would also say he had the gift of discernment. One thing that's not examined enough perhaps in his life is that when the Pope excommunicated Elizabeth, which many historians think was a disastrous choice that just made things far worse for English Catholics and did not persuade Elizabeth in any way to come closer to the Catholic Church. He did not follow the position some more militant Catholics followed that all allegiance to her shall now be cut off and we should dream of some Catholic monarch who will now rule us. He politely disagreed on this issue and when it came to his political allegiance, 
it did not completely line up with uh, the allegiance to the Pope and everything. So he thought on this, the Pope was clearly indicating, so where's counselors, we should cut out all allegiance to this excommunicated queen who was ahead of a false religion, a sort of imitation of the Catholic church in their eyes. He agreed religiously, she's not the head of the church anywhere, but politically he felt she was the authentic monarch. And he was English enough to feel parliament's constant reaffirmation that she's a legit legitimate monarch has to be given a certain weight. So I think there was that quality of discernment on complex political issues also that's typical of Campion. And finally, I had mentioned that when he preached or when he counseled people privately who were thinking of converting to the Catholic faith, he would often talk about Christ as king. Now, this is a motif in all Christian literature. However, it's very striking in the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, you end the um, first week of the exercises with the call of Christ the King. Imagine yourself in front of Christ the King summoning you. It's one of the key moments of the spiritual exercises that you're a subject of the King. You're embarrassed by your sin, how unfaithful you've been to the King, but you're called to a renewed piety and fidelity and devotion and service to the eternal King, Jesus Christ. This was central to his piety and his preaching and the spiritual advice he would give people when he talked with them, whether they converted or whether they didn't, this image of Christ the King comes up again and again and again in his writing and his preaching and his conversation. And while that is not uniquely Jesuit, I would say that's typically Jesuit because many Jesuits, when they do the spiritual exercises or when we celebrate the great feast of Christ the King before Advent, there is a focus on Christ as King that seems to fit us naturally and is central to our preaching and our personal devotion. So I put that out there as a few suggestions in what ways we might see him, not just as a great saint and martyr, but perhaps as a typically Jesuit saint, and also his choice to become a Jesuit, though there were no English Jesuits, and the order was relatively young, and he had other alternatives at Douay that did not involve entering any religious order, indicates a certain fervor and devotion to the Jesuit vocation that he lived out in a very dangerous apostolate and ultimately went to his death for. Okay, so in a nutshell, that's Edmund Campion. With any questions or comments? That's very interesting, Father. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Campion was so charming. Did you run across any indication that uh, people on the Protestant side in England really would have preferred that he not be tortured to death, that they should come up with some other way of dealing with him? Uh, frankly, I haven't found that. And I think one thing to remember, I mentioned earlier, a lot of my research is on French history, philosophy, 16th, 17th century. The wars of religion were brutal. And it was war to the death on both the Protestant and the Catholic side. I remember when I was doing some research on religious politics under Louis XIV, now that's the next century, but it's still the wars of religion because there was a strong Protestant minority in France. Louis XIV at first tolerated the Huguenots, French Protestants, but he turned against them and he started to exile them and tax them heavily, imprison them, torture was used. But he finally found out the way to get to the few Protestants who were holding out, who hadn't left France voluntarily, was he would take their children away. And the children would be given to Catholic orphanages or to very militantly Catholic families, and they would be raised as Catholics and told their parents were damned because they were heretics and really to have nothing to do with them. And Louis XIV found out that was a more powerful weapon against these Protestants who were in central France and these small Protestant villages than the use of any force. 
because when parents see their children taken away and being raised in what they believe is a false version of the gospel, many of them had no resistance to that. They couldn't part with their children. And so torture was used. And it, it, it's a period, you know, John Paul II, whom I admired so much, he had a statement before we celebrated the uh, 2000th anniversary of Christianity in the year 2000. He said, there's much to be grateful for. But he said, as we look back on the history of the church, there's something to regret. And that was the use of the sword to force people to convert to the faith. Now, that happened on the Protestant side. It happened on the Orthodox side with the Russians. It happened on the Catholic side in a nation like France and Spain. This early modern period, religious passions are unleashed. And while some people were willing to just do dialogue, and there were debates between Protestant pastors and Catholic priests during this period that would often involve Jesuits on the Catholic side, it's very striking that even in France, often these debates will be followed by a massacre depending as to who had the stronger military forces at their disposition. So I don't find much evidence that people were willing to really engage him. And these four times he was, he debated Protestant ministers in prison just strikes me as very ghoulish because a man had been tortured and no one was going to witness this on the Catholic side, but even then prison guards later would write in their journals or letters that he more than held his own in these debates. And he certainly never accepted um, renouncing the Catholic faith and he would never accept pleading guilty to what he knew was a false charge. Hmm. This is a very violent period. I also say as a philosopher, one of the sources of modern atheism and skepticism was the wars of religion. But sometimes people say, well, where does modern atheism come from? And they'll say, well, the rise of modern science. And, you know, can you accept the miraculous? Can you accept certain claims of the Bible? That's part of the story. But part of the story is also watching these Christians for two centuries annihilate each other in the name of the gospel, in the name of the cross. And so religion was privatized as a result. That's the solution the heads of state decided on. Religion would become primarily a private affair. And, but that violence is extremely problematic. Father, uh, yeah. what can you tell us about his canonization process? The canonization was really interesting because Paul VI reached out to the Anglicans. You know, 1970, we're five years beyond the end of Vatican II. The defense of religious liberty is one of the great issues of Vatican II and the church after great debate, comes down fairly on that side. And if you read the canonization uh, documents that came from the Vatican and the English bishops, on the one hand, it's celebrating the Catholic faith, the importance of the mass. But on the other hand, there's a recognition that there's a hope that this period of religious violence on all sides is behind us. So ironically, there's a sort of ecumenical ring to the documents at the time of the canonization, reflecting you know, the more charitable relationship between the Catholic Church and other Christian denominations. And of course, the Anglicans have had a special role because they always see themselves as midway between Protestantism and Catholicism. They do have bishops, priests, deacons, uh, the celebration of the Lord's Supper, as they would call it, has become more and more important. Most Episcopal churches in the United States would have the Lord's Supper, at least on a weekly basis. A few of them do it on a daily basis, something which really in the United States some decades ago, you wouldn't hear too much about. It would not be too common. So mm -hmm. there, there is a sort of effort at a certain rapprochement. And the canonization was a time to give a sort of ecumenical spin to the martyrdom of these people. But when John Paul II visited England, he was at Westminster Cathedral, which is the Catholic cathedral for the city of London, because you can't use the word cathedral in London unless you're Anglican. And that's true of many you know, large British cities by law, since Church of England is still the, the one is officially claimed as the state religion of England. Uh, Paul VI, I thought, uh, I'm sorry, John Paul II gave a beautiful sermon in which he pointed out at Westminster Cathedral, there were certain graves of the martyrs and he visited Tyburn. And he said, you have to realize for us Catholics, the mass is everything. 
And so many of the English martyrs were murdered and many English lay people were killed because of the celebration of the mass. You know, these priest holes were hiding people who would celebrate mass. P uh, priests who celebrated mass were criminals by that very nature as you get late into Elizabeth's reign. And it was a celebration of the mass, which was a crime. And many of the martyrs of this period basically died, just not for the Catholic faith, but for the freedom to celebrate the mass. Any other questions, comments? There you go. Yes. Uh, looking at the window, this is Regina here. Yeah. Um, I see that the, the two fellows directly behind uh, Edmund have, uh, I guess, their palm fronds. Yes. And that is because they're peaceful? That is because no. why? No. The palm frond <laughs> is a very traditional icon for martyrs. Okay. If you go into some of the old Roman basilicas, uh, you will see that uh, often the martyrs are presented in white robes. This is especially true if you go to Ravenna, if you go to churches very influenced by Eastern mosaics, or a little less Western, a little less statuary in, in Western churches. Often the, you will see it's the palm of the martyr, which they are holding. And this is a very traditional type of Christian iconography to show those saints who gave their life. It's a palm of victory that they have mm, triumphed okay. over persecution and opposition, and it is a palm of victory. I was out at a conference several years ago in Minneapolis at the law school of St. Thomas University, because much of the rest of the university is in St. Paul. But I was struck by the fact we had mass in their chapel, a Saturday vigil mass before the banquet for this particular group. And um, when you enter the chapel, you see like this enormous palm of victory over the door. And I did some work on the artist. It's a very modern chapel who designed it, but he went back to Ravenna and that whole tradition of the martyr has won the palm of victory. And I think it's a church of certain martyrs. I forget which group. And that's what it is. That's what the palm, palm branch is about. And the, the, the three in the forefront were the ones that were martyred that day yes. and the other two or group behind them that are just kind of slightly seen were kind of gathered into a canonization process. I don't know about that. I wondered about those two that you barely see. It's clear uh, those who were martyred that day are Alexander Briant and then uh, Ralph Sherwin who were martyred that day. I presume the reason you might not see their full face, it's to suggest there were many others who were martyred at Tyburn, but I'm not sure exactly who that would be. But it could be standing collectively, and that's why you don't see identifiable faces for uh, the others who followed them, quite literally, as they're following them in the uh, stained glass work. But I'm not certain on that. That would be my interpretation. Okay. And was he much older? He, he looks you know, like he's got 20, 30 years on the fellows behind him? Or I'm, is that just to show it was wisdom or something? I'm not so sure, because I was struck by that. He he dies at the age of 40. Now, okay. four, 40 in the 16th century is not 40 in the 21st century, right? I mean, I turned 70 in November, and I'm quite young by Jesuit standards these days. And uh, so, uh, but he does look sort of older. Now, that, that looking older, this is just a guess, because I'm not a specialist in iconography, either in the 20th century or in the 16th century. It could be an effort to show the wisdom of Campion. Sometimes you add some gray hairs and some wrinkles. If you're trying to show someone is wise, the way an Aristotle might be, or a Plato might be, or an Aquinas might be, sometimes they're presented as a little older, okay? Uh, so I'm not certain. I'm not certain about that. It could be the other two priests were younger. Now, remember, um, I do know the other two priests are people who uh, were Catholics, then they left the church, then they re-entered. They could well have been younger than Campion, because Campion has a long career before he enters the Catholic Church, having been raised a Catholic, but being an Anglican deacon. And then he has a time at Douai, then he has his time in Rome. 
Uh, we also know he met St. Charles Borromeo in Milan. Borromeo was the great reformer, founder of seminaries and the reformation of the clergy. And many people felt what he did pastorally in the diocese of Borromeo, much better preaching, uh, also promoting uh, new Eucharistic devotion, such as the 40 hours devotion is something he strongly promoted, which sort of caught wildfire throughout the Catholic church later. So he visited, um, he had like a number of lives before he became the Jesuit who lands in Dover. Okay. Right. Other questions? Thank you. You're welcome. Well, John, thanks oh, so Father, much. Did you say Moyes? Pardon? Um, I was just saying, did, did you say that he went to Oxford at the age of seven? And is that the no, normal no, said, at that time? No, I, I think... I think I said he went to Oxford and at the, uh, at the age of uh, 17, he became a junior 17. fellow. So he was at Oxford a little earlier. But again, that whole distinction between what we would call high schools and what are colleges, mm. that really develops far, far later. I mean, I know our high school in Washington, its official legal title is Gonzaga College and High School. I think that's true of one of our high schools um, in New York. Uh, Xavier uh, downtown in Manhattan, that really, that distinction develops later. I was surprised, I studied in France for a number of years. When I was in Bordeaux for a year studying French, what we call the Collège Saint-Joseph de Tivoli, which is our high school, but it really starts at kindergarten. Uh, it's mm -hmm. kindergarten, it's grade school, it's high school, and then there's an added year in France and Germany. A nice feature of that year is everybody has to study philosophy for a year, which I think is great on the high school level and extremely rare in the United States, of course. And um, but I, I it's something, you know, you could know easily, but it just hadn't occurred to me. And so these schools are much bigger than our high schools. A lot of the teachers you meet, I mean, some are doing basically kindergarten or even pre-K as well as grade school. So they have different pedagogical issues than we do in our typical high school. Yeah, Baltimore has Calvert Hall College, which is a high school. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, thanks, John. This certainly brought a lot out on all sorts of levels, uh, not least spiritual. And uh, I hope the rest of you will uh, spread the word that... Uh, you can really learn something <laughs> listening to these. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, great seeing Thank everybody you. again. Take care Thank now. You. Thank okay. you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a good Bye. day. Uh, this, is, this is Jim Ho. I lost the first half hour because I lost the internet connection. Um, and I'm, I'm talking now on a uh, residence association uh, computer that I happen to have because I'm the controller of the Residents Association. But uh, I, I don't know whether the building's lost. The, this is a laptop. My regular computer is a PC. And I don't know whether the building has lost the connections or what, but uh, I checked my internet connections. I thought they were okay, but... Uh, Jim, I think <laughs> this is recorded, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, it's been recorded. It's been recorded, yeah. Jim, so you can see it again. Yeah. Good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Not today, but I'd like to get the recording of it sometime. Yeah, yeah. Jessica, Jessica posted on the website, I think, or on on the parish website. It's where? Well, it's on the parish website. If you just click on the picture, I think it'll come up. The picture of St. Edmund Campion. Oh, okay. Okay. Good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Father Connolly. Oh, you're welcome. So great. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye, okay, everybody. Bye-bye.